Good evening and welcome to this week in review. Tonight's stories include Did We Owe at Muddy O, the Terry Fox Run, interview with the remaining candidates for the municipal election. These stories plus community events, the BBS Playbill, Off the Rack and more coming up after this. Try and catch the wind. Not an easy thing. Neither is growing up with an amputation. Through the CHAMP program, the War Amps is there to help from the very start. With artificial limbs, counseling, education, and most of all, a belief that for these kids, when it comes to success, the sky is the limit. The War Amps Winner's Circle. A tradition of amputees helping amputees. The annual Terry Fox run was a great success again this year. On Sunday, September the 16th, 94 participants took part in the annual Terry Fox run. Registration began at 1.30 p.m., during which time young and old alike passed along their pledges, names for the Wall of Hope, and bought t-shirts and buttons. Lioness Ruth Tucker, coordinator for the event, welcomed everyone and thanked them for their continued support. She introduced Tiffany Symes as a member of Terry's team and gave some background information about Terry Fox and the annual fundraiser which bears his name. Mrs. Tucker went on to read the names of those who had died from cancer and those who are still fighting and those who have survived. At 2 p.m. the walk began. Again this year the lioness has set up three juice stands, one in the Messrs area near the bus stop, one in the parking lot of the United Church and near the bank. All participants were encouraged to return to the community center to pick up their certificate and stickers. The total amount of pledges and donations was $1,254. This amount does not include t-shirts and button sales. Sponsors for the event, the Burgio Lioness, wish to thank everyone who supported the annual Terry Fox run. Tuesday of this week, we had an opportunity to speak to Pauline Parell, 
who is the coordinator for the Provincial Organ Donor Program. In our studio today, we have with us Pauline Perel, who's with the Organ Donor Program. Welcome to our studio. Hi. And welcome to Bergio. Well, thank you. My first visit here is great. <laughs> uh, what's the nature of your visit today? Well, I came down to Bergio because I was invited down originally uh, by Elaine Spencer, who is the patient care coordinator over at the health center, to come down and just increase awareness amongst her staff and the staff in the health center about organ and tissue donation. Okay. Now, how can one become an organ donor? Um, well, you can become an organ donor by uh, signing um, a card, if that's your wish, if you want to become an organ or tissue donor. You can sign your driver's license, indicating you wish to become an organ or tissue donor. And you can also sign the organ donor cards, which we uh, produce at the organ donor program, which is in this pamphlet here, which I'm going to leave with um, Marie. And a card for you to sign and a card to give to your family, which is really important that your family knows your wishes. Okay, because uh, that was my next question. Like, I know years ago when I became an organ donor, I just signed the paper driver's license. Yeah. And now that I have the card, it's on the side in green letters, right? That's right, yeah. So I didn't know if there might have been a different process now. Well, well, it's not a different process, but it's really a two-step process because um, you make up your mind, and it's a very personal decision if you want to become an organ or tissue donor. And uh, But really, you've only done half the step if you've filled out your card or your driver's license. The, the step that makes the biggest difference to families is if they tell their next of kin, which is usually okay. your husband, your sons, your daughters, or whoever's closest to you. That's the most, one of the most important things that needs to be done because if you ever found yourself in a, a situation of becoming an organ and tissue donor, it's your family that would be asked for consent and it makes things so much easier for them if they already know what your wishes are. So okay. this is a two-step process. Okay. Um, when I signed my driver's license, for example, um, I can't remember if tissue was there. Is that something new that has been added, or no? Um, that's on your on your card and okay. your driver's license because they'll say they'll ask you probably specifically, you know, donate my organs, which is your heart, your lungs, uh, kidneys, uh, liver, pancreas, and even bowel now is being transplanted from one person to another, which is the organ, and tissue is. Uh, your cornea, which is that clear little okay. layer on your eye, yeah. and we're doing bone retrieval here in Newfoundland too, which is used for bone grafts, and that's classed as tissue. Okay. So your corneas and bone is classed as tissue, and the rest of it is organ. Okay. Um, why do you think there's not more people signed up for the organ uh, donor program? Um, I think it's lack of awareness, and I think it's fears. Um, not getting the proper information about organ and tissue donation and the whole process that's involved. I think that's probably it and uh, not having the correct information to make that decision for yourself. Okay. Now is there a criteria to become an organ donor? Like for example age, blood type? Yeah. Uh, blood type really doesn't make any difference. Um, age, uh, they used to have an age limit on being an organ donor but they don't anymore because it's all done by an individual assessment on that person at that time because uh, we have a lot of uh, really fit 75 year olds out there and even 80 year olds and older and sometimes we have very unfit like 45 and 50 year olds and it all goes by your individual health assessment that's done at that time okay. of you maybe being in that situation of becoming an organ donor. Okay. They, um, they had an older lady, uh, she was 94 in Ontario, that actually donated her liver to somebody else. Okay. So. Um, I think what I meant was um, okay. my son now is, is, both of them actually, are soon going to be driving. Yeah. Now one of them is 17, the other one will be 16. Uh, is there a legal thing? Do they have to be 18 before they sign their well, donor they card? Be, they should be of legal age uh, of consent. Okay. And um, But we do a, a youth awareness program, grades 7 to 12, and we usually give people the opportunity to get the information, uh, especially teenagers, because that's like you say, that's the time when you're going to sign your driver's license. That's usually when it's brought to your attention. So we're trying to get information out to people so that when they do that, and even people who haven't signed the driver's license, um, I've got the right information to make that right decision okay. for themselves. But another thing too is not everybody in Newfoundland drives, so what True. do they do? True. So we have these cards here for people to sign, but even saying that, really if you don't have anything signed, it doesn't make any difference either because as long as you've told your next of kin your wishes about organ and tissue donation, 
that that's all you need to do. Okay. Yep. Now, um, I've I've kind of went through this with my family because when I signed my donor card, um, I think some members of my family were a bit shocked. Yep. Well, okay, what happens if you're in an accident or you go in a coma and they're coming to us and want your organs and you're not dead? Like, you know, yep. what do you do in that situation? Like. They, you know, maybe they're telling us you're dead and you're not, and that yeah. type. How would you answer to someone like that? Well, uh, that's a really common fear because even people who have their organ donor card signed sometimes feel, well, if I end up in hospital and they see my driver's license with the organ donor, are they going to do everything that they can to save my life? Exactly. Are the doctors and nurses going to do everything they can? But our legal code of ethics, physicians and nurses, direct us to. Um, make sure that we've done everything for that person possible to save their life. And only when nothing else can be done medically for that person, and if they meet the criteria to become an organ donor, do are the family approached at that time. So it's it's not kind of a sudden thing. Um, the, this thing takes a little bit of time. Uh, it doesn't usually happen that suddenly anyways. And it's time to talk to the family about it uh, when brain death happens. and. Um, so there is a bit of time. It's not a rush, rush thing, and the physicians and nurses will do absolutely everything they can to save that person's life. And only when absolutely everything has been done will even the subject of organ or tissue donation come up okay. for that person. Okay. Um, would you take us through the process of organ donor? Uh, for example, we'll use myself as an example. I'm a organ donor. I'm. I had a horrific ad accident with. God knows how much damage done. Yeah. What would happen if I went to an hospital and the doctors did their primary exam and says, you know, she's going to be whatever on life yeah. support? What would be the process then? Okay. Well, what would happen is they do a thorough assessment on you. Say, say you were in a motor vehicle accident, you happened to go through the windscreen and had, say, a massive uh, head injury. Maybe you weren't wearing your seatbelt um, or thrown out the vehicle and, and uh, had a massive head injury. Um, the doctors and physicians would do everything to revive you when you got to the hospital. If you, if you were not breathing, uh, didn't have a heartbeat, they would do everything to revive you. And if your heartbeat uh, came back and you, you started breathing again but weren't able to breathe on your own, they'd probably put you on a breathing machine and assess your head injury. They'd have to do a thorough assessment, and you'd probably go for what I know a lot of people are common, commonly referred to as CAT scans. So mm -hmm. they do a special scan. It's a special type of X-ray on your head to see what the, t the extent of the injury was, so that they knew what they were dealing with. Now, very often, people who end up going to Cornerbrook, who have suffered a really bad injury like that, if there's anything that sur surgically that can be done you would be transferred out to St. John's because that's our neurosurgical center. So you would automatically be transferred out there. Now, if your head injury was so severe that they knew that there was nothing else to be done for you, there was nothing they could do for you in Cornerbrook, and speaking to the neurosurgeons and the specialists in St. John's, they wouldn't be able to do anything for you because you had such a massive head injury. They would leave you in Cornerbrook and they would leave you on the machine and make sure that everything um, was all normal, like your blood sugars were normal, your temperature was normal. Um, everything has to be normal in your body before they'll do what they call the brain death protocol. And the brain death protocol is a series of, of tests which are done on a person to make sure that that person doesn't have any brain function left. And what it means is that the blood circulation has been cut off to all your brain cells in your brain so that there's nothing working anymore in your brain. So that's basic, basically it. And uh, the two physicians do these series of tests. And they both must come to the same conclusion that, you know, it's irreversible brain damage. There's nothing that can be done for this person. But we are keeping the, the lungs going um, to give the heart the oxygen. And it, the heart will continue beating on its own. And if we were to take that person off the ventilator, off the breathing machine, within minutes they would die. Okay. So really the person it would be clinically, like you would be clinically okay. dead at that time. Okay. But the family wouldn't be approached until it had been confirmed that you had actually um, you know, succumbed to brain death. So really it's certainly not a, a, a rush job, a hurry up oh, job no, then? No, no by, okay. by no means, no, okay. no, it's not, wouldn't be like that at all. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, would the organ donor be um, disfigured after, uh, say, if I agreed to uh, uh, donate my organs and I had passed on, would I be disfigured? 
No, no, there's no disfigurement with uh, organ or tissue donation. Um, there's an incision um, in their abdomen. It's just like going for a big uh, abdominal operation. And we sew, sew that person, the organ donor, up afterwards, and there's an, a dressing put on. And if um, the family uh, want an open casket funeral, there would be nothing to stop that family having an open casket funeral. And if they didn't want anybody to know that their family member had been an organ donor, nobody would ever know. Okay, so would it delay the funeral process? Not at all, not at all, okay. no. Because organ donation, once that person is established as being brain dead, organ retrieval usually takes place within 12 hours, usually, because we have to get the teams in from Halifax to do organ retrieval, or even from the mainland up to, as far as London um, to come down and do the organ retrieval, and then they take the organs back with them. So there would, 12 hours, there wouldn't be any real delays in, in funeral arrangements, no. Okay, so what about the uh, re religious aspect of donor, organ donors now? Um, well, that's interesting. There's no, there's no religion on earth that really uh, doesn't condone, uh, condones organ uh, donation. All religions, all major religions support it. Even the Pope came out in the World uh, Transplant Conference there, I think it was in 1998 and 1999, and came out in support of organ donation, saying it was a, a really a true gift from one person to another, and that's what it is. It's a real unselfish act, and a gift from one person to another that is an absolutely priceless gift to give to somebody. Okay, well actually that's one of the main reasons why I signed my card. Now, is there a shortage of organ donors yes. and organs? Yes, there is. There are about 3,500 people at the moment in Canada waiting for an organ transplant of some kind. Most of it is kidneys. About 80% of people who are waiting for transplants need kidney transplants. Um, in our region here we have um, a small group of people who are waiting for a kidney transplant and we have a few people waiting for corneal transplant too and we already uh, have people who have bone grafts here in Cornerbrook as well done by the orthopedic surgeons here. Okay, is there anything else you'd like to have? Uh, no, um, these uh, pamphlets that I'm going to leave with Marie, one is from the Provincial Organ Donor Program and it's the open pamphlet which are stands for the Organ Procurement Exchange of Newfoundland and open and that's what we mean it's opening to the do opening the door to a new beginning for a lot of people who are waiting for a transplant and also there's another one that's really good as a pamphlet it's called Let's Talk About It okay. and that's from the Kidney Foundation and that is a really good pamphlet for anybody to give them a little guide in, in how to get a family meeting on the go sit down and gives them little points them in the right direction in you know what to do about organ donation and talk about it as a family because it really is a family discussion um, time for people to sit down just take the time to make up your mind and make your wishes known and I always tell people that um, if you want to be an organ or tissue donor that's fine and if you don't if it really makes you feel uncomfortable that's okay too as long as I'd like to know that we've got the right information out to people in order for them to make that decision okay. and then it's a truly personal decision and I always say that because you ha it has to be something that you're comfortable with um, you go to bed and sleep at night and you think yes I'm an organ donor and I'm really comfortable with that mm -hmm. or if you're a little bit unsure if there's any questions I can ask that would clear up or clarify a few things for you by all means people can get in touch with me or if you're just not comfortable with it and that's okay too. Okay well we really uh, thank you for coming in today and giving us some information on this. Um, at the hospital were you did you leave some pamphlets? Yes I did there? I okay. left some with Elaine and uh, leaving leaving some cards with her too. Some of the pamphlets Anytime the you're in town there. just drop by and give us an update on any programs that you might be yeah. involved in on organ donors we really appreciate it. Oh thank you very much for having me and Maria really Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Oh, you're <laughs> kindly welcome. Okay. If anyone would like to have more information, you can contact Pauline Perel, coordinator for the Provincial Organ Donor Program. Her office is located at the Western Memorial Regional Hospital, Level 2. Her telephone number is 637-5373. Stay tuned for more of this week in review coming up after this. Master, a robot from Planet Danger. I can put my arm back on. 
You can't. So play safe. On Thursday of last week, someone called to report a whale in the Muddy Ole area. Brian Mead called to report that the carcass of a dead whale had washed up in the cove in Muddy Ole. The Coast Guard suggested that Mr. Mead call the Environmental Response Department in St. John's. They informed Mr. Mead that they would come out and take a look. By this time, the badly decomposed whale was causing quite a stink. Other residents also called to complain. Finally, on Friday, September the 14th, the Coast Guard was given the okay to tow away the whale. Albert Ingram with the Coast Guard informed us that the whale was towed to Round Counter Arbor and secured so that it wouldn't drift back into shore again. Because of the decomposed state, Mr. Ingram stated that the whale had been dead for quite some time. We send a big thank you to Brad Green for giving us his found footage. On last week's broadcast, we had interviews with four of the candidates for the upcoming municipal election. This evening, we present the other four candidates. In our studio today, we have with us Mr. Scott Linehan, who is a candidate for the upcoming municipal election. Welcome, Mr. Linehan. Thank you, Marie. Uh, what made you decide to run for council? Well, I've been, uh, I've been living here in Virgil for this is my third year now. and. Uh, after getting to know a number of the people and getting to know a lot of the parents and the community members, um, I've become increasingly um, frustrated with what I perceive to be the government's indifference to the people of Burgio. And, uh, and I think it's time, for, uh, it's time to try to initiate a change and, and to put people back to work. Uh, I really, really want to try to make my difference in, uh, in this community. And uh, I think 
being a member of council, I think I can bring a lot forward to the count as, as a council member and to uh, initiate um, change and to get work back in the, to the people of Virgil. Um, I think I bring a youth and an energy that would uh, certainly be a, a real asset to the council. Um, I also live, I've, I've lived outside the community, I've lived in Labrador, I've lived in many places in Newfoundland. I think my experience um, in living in other places would be a real asset as well to the council. I have met many people, I've, uh, I've met many ministers, sat in on many meetings, um, from Mr. Grimes when he was education minister to Mr. Parsons, our current member. So uh, I think I, I can bring a lot with my outside experience to this position. Um, so uh, I think uh, I, w I would really like to, to do my part to, to make a change and, and to, uh, to make Virgil back to its uh, once booming town it used to be. And, and we start small, but uh, we have to start somewhere, and I want to do my bit to make a difference. Okay. Now, if you're elected to uh, council on uh, September 25th, what are some of the accomplishments that you would like to do for council? Well, uh, again, we have to start small, but there's, there's a lot we need to look at. And, uh, and the first thing that we need to really address is, uh, is the fish plant. In, in my two years here, um, I haven't seen the fish plant open, and that's a real, real shame. And uh, I've been real trou really troubled by that, and I really want to do something to, uh, to try and initiate change and get the fish plant back open. I become increasingly agitated with uh, people fishing our coastal waters and taking the quotas and bringing them to plants elsewhere. It, it, it's, it's very frustrating to, as a member of this community to see that happen, and I want to do my bit to change it. As well, I'd like to see further economic development in other projects. Uh, we have the greenhouse starting very shortly, I, I hope, and uh, to petition the government to get a more diversified economic development base here in the Burjo area. Um, I would like to see tourism promoted on a greater scale. Frequently when I travel the province to, to meetings and, and visiting family and friends, people always, people always say, Burjo, they had the, the nice, nice uh, park out there. And that's not awareness enough. I want Burjo to really be, to really ring a bell with people and say, I got to go over there. That's a place I need to see. And I think uh, we have a real, a real bud here and we can really blossom it and uh, I would really like to see that that happen so uh, tourism is something that we really really need to address in, in this community um, the ICT project there's no reason why people in this community uh, couldn't be involved with uh, information technology Burjo could serve as the hub for the whole western region for that matter uh, where you're located we don't need to be in Stephenville you don't need to be in Port Basque if it's all going to be through wireless computer systems you can equally live in Burjo and do that and uh, I want to see that I want to see that happen as well, the water situation is one of, of grave concern. Um, water is, is recognized around the world as a fundamental right for people. And I don't think it's, uh, it's proper for the government to say, listen, a million dollars has been earmarked for Burjo for water treatment. And, and so we're going to be forever discriminated against because we've got that million dollars. Water by the World Health Organization is a fundamental right that's a for everybody in this in this planet, so um, I don't want Burjo to be discriminated against in some manner because uh, because we've earmarked a million dollars for for our, uh, for our town, and uh, again to to have the fish plant up and and uh, and running again to its its former self that's really really important. So I'd like to see a, a nice wide array of things change in Burjo, and hopefully I'll do my bit to uh, to see it happen. Okay. Um now, with the uh, present unemployment situation, which, of course, you're very aware of, where do you see Burgio five years from now? There's no reason, in my mind, why Burgio can't be uh, a flourishing community again. It's, uh, it's not a matter of will for the people. The will is there. The energy is there. The uh, creativity is there. That's not the problem. The problem is we have to deal with bureaucracy and, uh, and what I think is indifference by, by uh, our provincial and federal governments to, to the people in, in our area. Um, I see Burjo and people here working again, and uh, there's no reason it couldn't be. If we get our fair share of quota, and I'm not saying take it from everyone else, I just want what I think is right, is our fair share. And that, that's only fair. And uh, I want Burjo to, uh, to get what it's due. So uh, I, I foresee people working again. As well, if, if we promote tourism the way we should, I don't think Burjo is a place we should see. I think Burjo should be a place you go to. It's our tourism destination. So if people are planning vacations, we're going to go to Burjo, just as if we're going to go to St. John's to see Signal Hill, or we're going to go to the Grosmore National Park on the Northern Peninsula. 
we should make Burgio a tourism destination. So I think uh, that has real, real marketing potential for, for a good tourism industry here, which brings in, of course, hundreds of million dollars a year to our, to our economy provincially. So uh, I'd like to see that. As well, capital projects can continue. There's uh, no reason why we couldn't have capital projects continue in this community. And to further develop that, uh, recreation is very important to me. Um, I would like to see the youth of this community um, have their demands and their needs met. And uh, I think recreation is very important. And uh, if I were to get in on council, I would be the voice for recreation. Um, I believe in it uh, wholeheartedly. Um, health and fitness is, is something, it's imperative for everybody. It's, 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 a, it's a need to survive. And uh, I think the people of this community can really, really benefit from a good, healthy recreation program. And uh, if elected to council, I'm going to be that voice. And uh, recreation is certainly going to be on my, on my agenda if I, if I were to get in on council. So all these areas, I think all this can, can really um, let Burgio open its wings again and restore it to its former self. Okay, now, um, if the opportunity presented itself, would you take the mayor's position? Why or why not? Why not? I think uh, the position of mayor is something that should be left for the people to decide. It's, uh, it may be a little presumptuous on my part to, uh, to say I'd, I'd run for mayor and I wouldn't now, given the fact that I haven't even been elected to council. So, uh, but having said that, if, if the votes um, warrant themselves or, le or if they're one-sided enough to, uh, to my favor, and if, if people are really, really want to see me in on council and, uh, and the votes reflect that, I would certainly be glad to put my name in for the mayor position. Um, I think um, I would presume that the uh, current incumbent, Mr. Han, will be uh, seeking his position again. And I think competition is a very healthy thing in a democracy. And, uh, if the people of Burgio really want to see a difference made in the community, I would be more than happy and honored to put my, put my name forward for the, uh, for the mayoral position. And uh, that way it would give people a choice, a legitimate choice as to who they would like to see as, as mayor. I think I could bring, uh, I think I bring uh, a good education and a, a well-trained uh, mind to the, to the position. 250 children are entrusted to my care every day, and I, I, I don't doubt one bit that people would entrust their community if, uh, under, my, under my care. And uh, so I would feel, uh, if the people would, would feel comfortable with that, I could certainly, uh, I would certainly put my name forward in the, uh, in the event that the, the votes reflect that, and I'd be uh, more than honored to do so. Okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I guess on a final note, I would uh, like to wish every success to our candidates. Of course, naturally one person will be left out, but I don't see that as a loser, I see that as a winner. Given the fact that uh, the election is in three days, um, everybody is going to be a winner. The fact that one person didn't get elected is not really a loser, in my opinion. It's a winner because that person tried to get on council, and in that case, everybody wins. So uh, I think campaigning is important for me. Um, I want people to know I'm serious about it, and I've, I've, uh, I've campaigned. I've shook hands, I've put up posters because I want people to know I'm dead serious. I, I, got, I got a lot to offer, Burgio, and... Uh, and the whole area, and uh, I want people to know that I'm very serious about getting in uh, on council. I encourage everybody to get out and vote on their day. If, if uh, on September 25th, and they look at the slate and there's eight people there, and people aren't comfortable with it, voting for seven, they can vote for one, or they can vote for three or five. But I would encourage everybody to get out and vote. I think that's what's paramount important, because uh, it's, it's a democratic right that we all share across this country, and. Uh, and we should really exercise that right. It's, it's really, really an honor and a privilege to get out and vote. And this is the first time in 16 years that the people of Burgio have got the opportunity to get out and vote. So uh, hopefully uh, on September 25th, on Tuesday, everyone will get out and do that, and they'll vote uh, what's in their best interest. And I really, really look forward to that day. Well, we certainly thank you for joining us today and wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Marie. Today in our studio, we have with us George Reed, another candidate for the upcoming municipal election. Welcome, Mr. Reed. Good night, Marie. Um, as a member of the previous council, what do you think are some of the uh, council's accomplishments? Well, I, I suppose I've got to start off by saying that uh, I've really been only on council just a little over a year. And, uh, and part of that time, I think about eight months of that time, I was even absent out of the uh, two-year period. I was uh, up in mainland uh, for eight months, you know, for family reasons. and. Uh, and 
really since I've been home, and uh, I, I think probably some of the things like uh, the main reason that I, like for me getting on council was the was the fish plant. I, I was on a number of uh, committees that dealt with the fish plant since uh, '93, trying to get the fish plant over. And, uh, and Mayor Han appointed me to a, a committee, uh, the last committee that he struck, uh, appointed me to represent the, the business in town. And I thought, <clears throat> being on a committee, and if I was on council at the same time, probably uh, would have been able to have more input in trying to get the plan open. And you know we, you know we worked hard trying to get that plan open, and we were pretty near successful. You know we were for a four week period we were I suppose you know <clears throat> and then unfortunately the turn of events in the, in the crab industry just uh, just killed it and uh, and I think it was due to the efforts of uh, uh, Marianne and, and the committee and uh, and the people that were putting uh, putting the pressure on the, the politicians and that that we just about succeeded in getting it and if the crab uh, quotas weren't uh, weren't cut I, I think we would have had it okay so, you know and that I, that's what I would say. The, my major, uh, major thing, major reason for getting on council, and uh, and probably would have been a major achievement off council if we had succeeded. So, so what was your uh, what's your reason for uh, throwing your hat in the ring again this time? Well, it's still the plan. Okay. It's still the plan. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, uh, my uh, <clears throat> my thought is to plan. If plan doesn't open, then. Uh, uh, the future for Virgil, that is, the uh, employment future, I mean, it's going to be terrible. I mean, it's devastating. It is devastating, though. I mean, for people having to leave, you know, and, and uh, leave town and, and <clears throat> go all over the place to try to get enough money to, you know, to get their stamps and come back and live, that, that's no way to live. There's just no way to live. I mean, you have to have opportunities here. Because if you don't have them, uh, I mean, what's going to eventually happen? And we're, we've been seeing it. The population probably has dropped about... I suppose 700 now uh, since 93. I think our population has dropped, and we're, all of our young people are going. You know, the, I mean, we're going to lose the 18-year-olds up that we wouldn't have lost. Uh, you know, we would lost some of them due to their, uh, you know, the careers that they're going after. But a lot of them would have stayed. But the biggest uh, thing that we're going to lose, and we are losing, is the people in the 30, 30-year-old bracket. You know, and even up in the 40-year-old bracket. I mean, and this is a, this is really devastating, and uh, and I think that if we don't keep after keep pressure on the government and, and other people who are involved in this plan up here, and uh, that we're just going to lose out. And, and I think every bit of effort that we can put in trying to get this plan open, because I haven't given up on a plan, and, and you know, you know, not in uh, not by one thing, but uh, and I think I think it's possible that it will open, and. Then, I really do think that uh, all you need is a, is a quarter of crab. If you had a quarter of crab tomorrow, designated for this area, it would open. I mean, uh, I don't think Barry's going to bring any fish down here to open it because he's got all kinds of other plants and he's not going to do it. You know, so it looks like to me what we need is a, a quarter of ourselves. You know, this town, and I think it would open just like that. Now, how to get that? Of course, uh, it's difficult. But I mean, it's. Uh, I don't think it's not un unattainable. I think you know. I think I think we can get it, and we will get it. Uh, you know, if we keep keep after it. Uh, okay, so that would be uh, now. If you're elected on September 25th, obviously that would be your number one priority to accomplish is to get the plant open. Oh, wait, but, uh, is there anything else but, uh, that you would like to see? Well, yes, and you know, I mean, I'm sure. Uh, well, you, everyone knows that the water. Uh, the situation in Birdsville hasn't been good over the last couple of years. Uh, off and on, it hasn't been good. They've done everything they can for it, but we've been successful in getting, I think, it's $2.3 million to upgrade a water system. I think, you know, that was, that's very good. And that was, uh, I think that was on behalf of the pressure from council uh, to do their MHA, uh, Mr. Parsons, and, uh, that, you know, we've, we've got awarded that uh, amount of money to, uh, to clean up our water problem. You know, so I mean, so that's that's a that's an ongoing thing, and that will that will be cleaned up. And I think it was probably uh, one of the disappointing things. Like I said, I wasn't there for most of the uh, debate on this. Is that we 
we didn't uh, get our arena. I mean, there's a there's a hell of enough population out there that uh, would like to have a, an arena, and, you know, and I'm one of them. I mean, I would certainly like to have an arena, but I, I vote when it comes to a tough choice of whether or not you, uh, you can have one. It depends on whether or not the town can support it. And I think Plymouth did, they did show that the majority of people in town didn't want it. But that doesn't mean, say, of course, that uh, it's not something that you still can't go after, you know. I mean, uh, there might be ways. There's money there that the uh, sports committee have uh, raised over the years, you know, 130000 or something like that, 120000 So that money's still there. And I think the MHAs, of course, they're, they're going to be looking for to do something for the area when the next election comes around. So. You know, that, that's something I, I think, I mean, there, there's 25 or 26 percent of the people who voted still wants an arena, you know. There's nothing, you know, I would love to see an arena in, in town, some sort or another, you know, we really would. And so if an opportunity comes to support something like that, well, I certainly will, you know. And, uh, and the board, you, you almost can't list off all the things, because a lot of things that come to, to council, you know, comes from meeting to meeting, so you really don't know what's, uh, what's going on. And, uh, you know, I suppose if one is on the council, you always got the interests of the town at heart. And if there's any, uh, you know, other things that are innovations that are coming into, into the town, you know, you had to make decisions on that. And so I would be, you know, quite there to, of course, try to encourage anything to come into this town. Um, now, you, you already talked about the um, plant situation. Now, and you're quite aware of that because you, you yeah. certainly work closely with it. Now, what do you see for Burgio five years from now? Well, you know, if we can get the plant open, I see the, I can see the, the town, uh, of course, bouncing back. And, uh, well, the, the town is pretty vibrant now, really. You know, I mean, the people in town, you look at their houses, they, they really keep their, their property up. I mean, they're doing a terrific job at that. And, you know, and... Hopefully, I hope there's nobody in dire straits in town, you know, but uh, a lot of people seem cheerful and, you know, but I'm sure if you had the, the plant operating, you know, uh, because this is what's going to give the big numbers of em employment is, is the plant. And <clears throat> that's what you really want. And if you get the plant going, I think five years from now the town will be a going concern. Now, if you don't get the plant, well, I think the population is going, to, is going to gradually go down here steadily because, uh, like I said, people will go away to uh, to work and get good opportunities, good jobs. They're not going to uh, leave them. They're going to eventually see that probably just as well, better to stay where they are. So we're going to lose, uh, we're going to steadily lose people for sure. Okay, um, and of course I pose this question to all the other candidates. If the opportunity presented itself, would you take the mayor's position? Why or why not? Well, I think that would be a question I would have to, uh, if I get elected on council, I would have to make up my mind at the time. Uh, if Mayor Han uh, uh, is elected uh, to council, I mean, uh, I certainly wouldn't, I wouldn't even consider taking the mayor's position with Mayor Ann there. Mayor Ann is a good mayor. You know, he's, uh, you, know you, won't, you won't find too many people in, in this town uh, giving their time like Mayor Han has done for the past four years. There's no question about it. I mean, he doesn't get paid for this, you know, and, uh, you know, he spent hundreds and hundreds of hours on the, on, just on the telephone himself, you know. I mean, he might not be pleased with every decision he makes, but, I mean, that's it. I mean, people make decisions with the facts that they, get, they have. And everything, he, everything he's done since I've been on council, since I've been attending meetings, have always been in the interest of the town. I mean, we got a good mayor. There's no question about it. And, uh, you know, I was supporting them all 100%. You know, it's, uh, I mean, and, and the other thing, too, I mean, when decisions are made on council, like, you know, some people think that, you know, it's the mayor's decision or the mayor, you know, push this or push that type of thing. But, I mean, every resolution that gets passed gets passed by majority. So, I mean, for seven people there, four people have to support it. Otherwise, it doesn't get passed. And, uh, that's why you need good counselors there to be able to, uh, you know, debate things and see the rationale. And every time a decision is made, it gets made by the majority. And when it gets enacted, it's not only Mayor Han, 
you know, if you want to blame somebody, it's not only Mary Ann, it's, it's the other counselors that support it. I mean, and there's no counselor, I'm sure, in the meetings that I've attended, uh, would ever support anything that, uh, you know, that's detrimental to the town. I mean, none of us are there paid members. I mean, it's just, we, we go there to, thinking, of course, that we can benefit the town. That's, 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 I mean, that's the only reason, I'm sure, most people are there. I mean, you know, that's the only reason I can see why anybody would be there, you know. So therefore, if you want to make a decision, you make decisions on the facts that you're presented with, and hopefully you make, make a decision that's going to please the majority, you know. And, and I think that's probably all you can do in the long run. Okay, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, I suppose the thing that I would uh, uh, probably sh would like to see is that everyone get out and vote. And uh, then I suppose that those then who do get elected, uh, you know, they can say, well, I helped elect them, and, uh, or uh, if they didn't get elected, they can say, I helped defeat them. So, you know, and then when decisions get made, then uh, hopefully they probably be pleased with them, you know. Oh. Yes, uh, I think every citizen should exercise the right to vote. Okay, well, we certainly thank you for joining us, and we wish you uh, all the best in the election. Thanks, Marie. Thanks for having me in. It's been a long time trying to get me in there. <laughs> <laughs> we have with us in our studio today David McDonald. He's another candidate for the upcoming municipal election. Welcome, David. Good morning. Uh, what made you decide to run for council? Well, there are a number of things that made me decide to run for council. Uh, since returning to the community uh, back in February, in early spring, I attended a couple of the town council meetings. And during the process, as an outsider looking in and not being a part of council, I didn't actually have a voice, and all I could do was sit back and uh, observe. And I like to have an input in some of the decisions that were being made and are being made by town council. And the only way that I can actually have a voice in the decision-making process is to actually be a member of the town council. I also uh, like the idea that there's going to be an election. The, I knew there were seven people running. Uh, we have not had a municipal election in quite some time. And I felt it was time that if we had an extra candidate, an eighth candidate running, that uh, the people would get out and vote and they would actually have some input into who's going to be on their council. Um, at least now when we're the elected officials are in council, they would have some idea or some sense of knowing that, listen, I'm, I have an X number of supporters in the community and that when I speak, my voice carries some weight and that I'm here by the people's choice. And, and I'd like to see that. Okay. What are some things that you would uh, like to see accomplished if you're elected to council? Well, there are a number of things that I'd like to see the council supporting and pushing. And uh, well, first and foremost, the fish plant. Uh, and I, with a community that has such a strong background and history in the fishery, that I think is very important that we maintain those ties. And I think it's very important to the community that we had the fish plant running. But the the other side of it is I think that the community also has to support a lot of other smaller initi initiatives in the, that are upcoming in town. I think uh, referring to the, the uh, idea of not having all your eggs in one basket. Uh, when the fishery collapsed quite some time ago that we were in the position that the community dealt, uh, uh, relied heavily on the fishery. And when the fishery collapsed, it was total devastation for the economy. And I think it's very important that we uh, not put all of our eggs in one basket. I think we need to have a number of different smaller initiatives, smaller companies, and I think we should be supporting a lot of smaller uh, ten, five, uh, five to ten, any job in the community is very important. And if you have a number of small projects in tourism or um, the greenhouse project, those types of projects, all those little small projects add up. And I think it's very important that the community support those little tiny initiatives so that in the event in the future, if there's another problem with our major employer, like the fish plant, that we can, we're not as drastically affected by what happens so that you can cushion the blow. Um, I also would like to see uh, some work in 
the areas of the water treatment plant. I, I know that the current town council is pushing that forward and I'd like to make sure that that project stays on track so that we can actually use the water that's coming out of our taps instead of everyone going into the watering hole in, into uh, uh, Beaver Pond. I would also like to, I know there was a plebiscite held back some time ago about the arena. Uh, I think that there should be some research or some, some effort put into some scaled back version of the arena. I think that the kids in this community need some kind of recreational facility. Uh, I, I understand when they started the original plans for the school that they were trying to encompass it all inside the school. But that's, that's been taken off the shelf. Uh, the arena now, uh, since the plebiscite, that's been taken off the shelf. I think there needs to be some other facility put in the community that gives the kids some energy, some, somewhere to, to burn off their energy. And uh, th those are the main issues that I'd like to be push forward, right? Okay. Now with the uh, present unemployment situation in Burgio, uh, where do you see Burgio five years from now? I think Burgio has a very strong future. Um, like any community that lost its major uh, employer with the fishery back 10, 12 years ago when the fish plant stopped, everyone has to, it's natural to sit back and get your head around your future and what's happening and, and Burgio spent a fair bit of time recovering or dealing with the loss of the fish plant but it comes a time when you have to pick up the sticks and say listen we have to do something about it, or we have to get on with our lives and, and do some things so a lot of the people in the town have moved on and gone uh, out to work on the seismic and and they come back in the winter uh, in in the summertime you get a lot of people that are going to Nova Scotia for uh, different jobs working uh, on the fish plants over there, working on the farms. And one of the things that these people are doing is they're getting out and seeing what other communities are doing and other job prospects that are out there and they're getting some experience. These people are coming back to the communities in their down times and, and they're, they have a whole different uh, experience that they're bringing back with them and they have different ideas. That So I think that the community is going to prosper from a lot of little smaller things. Like I noticed that there are outfitters operating out of Burgio now, and there's tourism guides, these types of things. So I, I think that the community is going to, going to be growing. And like myself working in the IT sector, uh, the, the community has a lot to sell and offer uh, people working in technology-based industries, because you don't have to be working downtown Toronto anymore. You can actually be working on computer software programs in smaller communities. Now, there's, there's a lot of money to be made on that side. But also, uh, I've noticed during the summer this year that there's been a record number of people using the park compared to what I was used to back growing up here. And I think it's very important that we push the tourism side of it and get those people back in. And it was very uh, gratifying to see uh, a tourism boat come in here this summer. Now, uh, so I think that there's a lot of future there on the tourism side, and the, the federal and the provincial governments are pushing that side, and I think the people of Burgio are starting to get on the road that, that listen, we're not working on the fish plant, so we've got to find different avenues of, of an income, and I think the, the attitude is starting to change in the community, and that we're looking for other ways. Now, you still have to be focused on the fish plant, but we're we're still looking at other ways while we're working on the fish plant. And even in the event that the fish plant is running, that we still need all these smaller industries to, to keep the community going. And I, I see it, Burgio as changing a lot with its history in the fish plant, but maintaining those ties, but still growing up at the same time. Very good. Um, if, the pr uh, if the mayor position presented itself. Would you uh, take the opportunity of becoming mayor of this town? Why or why not? Well, that's a tough question because f the first thing you have to do is get on council. And uh, that's my primary goal now is to get on council and to have a voice. The mayor's job is a very tough job. I, I think it's easy for anyone to sit home in their house and say, oh, the mayor's not doing a good job or he's doing a good job. It's easy to criticize. Uh, 
the first thing you have to do is make sure you have the support of the people behind you. And this is one of the primary reasons that we have an election, so that when you get into the council chambers, you know that you're there with the support of the people, and you have X number of voters that voted you in, so that you have a more important say in, in, in the voice of council. But the mayor's job, I think, uh, requires a lot of time and a lot of dedication and a lot of work. And it has, the people have to realize that when the mayor speaks, he's speaking first and foremost on behalf of the town, and he also has to speak with the support of the council. So uh, I'm not saying that I, I would take it, and I'm not saying I wouldn't. It, it depends on how the voting system turns out, and that uh, I certainly have to reevaluate what I'm doing uh, with my life and my, part my, my uh, downtime, shall we say. I've I'm involved in the Lions Club, the Ground Search Rescue, and the Fire Brigade. There's a certain number of things. So if I do get elected to council and the opportunity presents itself, I certainly would have to reevaluate what it is, what my priorities are, and where I want to dedicate my time. So uh, first of all, I want to concentrate on getting elected. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, this is the first time in 15 or 16 years that the community of Virgil has had a chance to vote and have a say in who's their elected leaders in the town council. So I'd like to make sure that everybody gets out to vote. Uh, and I want to uh, ensure to people that you don't have to vote for seven candidates. I think there's, there's eight people running. It's very unfortunate that one of us is not going to make it on council. But out of the seven people that you chose, you don't have to choose seven. If you don't think two or three of us should be on council, you can vote for the three or four people that you think would make it on council. You can go in and you can vote for one person, you can vote for two, or you can vote for a whole slate of seven candidates. So I think you have to be careful when you, uh, clear when you go in to vote, you vote for who you want to vote for, not because you feel you have to vote for the number of people. But I think the most important thing is it's the first election that we've had in quite some time, and I think it's very important for the people to get out and have a say in who their elected council members are. Okay, well, we certainly uh, wish you the best of luck in the upcoming election. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Thank you. With us in our studio this evening, we have Mayor Ann, who is a candidate for the upcoming municipal elections. Welcome back. It's good to be back, Marie. Yes, did you have a good trip? I had a good trip, but it was also good to get back. Yeah, and I don't know if I should be calling you Mayor Ann. Are you still mayor? I'm still mayor okay. until Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so I can call you Mayor Ann. Okay, as a member of the previous council, what do you consider some of this council's achievements are? Well, I think uh, our council, you know, I, I don't know how, uh, how good the people's memories are, but... Uh, I can remember when this council we came, and I, if it wasn't the first, you know, it wasn't the first year because that was 97. In 98, uh, we had our streets completely repaved, and there was, there was lots of room for pavement there. The sidewalks were, in fact, deplorable. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I guess that's what I would say would be one of the first ones, you know. And, uh, and I don't know if uh, you can also remember the old wooden signs, two peas of plywood across a wooden post and things like that. Well, as far as I'm concerned that uh, our town now is, uh, I'm not going to say they got the proper street names, but at least uh, the names are put on proper uh, uh, proper postings and so on. So I think that's uh, that's two big ones. I think the, anybody who walk around, they go out and they look at the memorial site there where the monuments and and that corner out there, I think that is, uh, that's a plus for our town. I've had quite a few comments, not only people from our town, but outside of our town who feels that that's great. I think our playground, that's quite evident. It's standing there for as a testimony to uh, as good a, a playground as anybody can see as they go around, and I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, the council to be We'll even see that there can be more improvements there because, as far as I'm concerned, there is room for still more improvements. So I consider that a plus. And, uh, and I think if this council, is one thing this council did, it uh, raised the profile of municipal government uh, within this municipality anyway. And, and, uh, and you know, uh, we've got an election this year. And that's the first one from what I know for about 15 years yeah. or something like that. So, you know, uh, 
I, I, I think we must have been doing something right. We got somebody a little bit uh, either uh, pleased or displeased enough so that someone got up and uh, pushed it into an election this year. So I think we kept the people informed. I think we were uh, forward with them. I mean, we, uh, I don't think this council uh, pulled any punches, to be quite honest with you. You know, I mean, uh, we brought in a, uh, a tax collection policy which is, according to the town clerk, you know, as far as he was concerned, that was a godsend for him. He's, he no longer got to go to council to find out what he's got to do. He's got a set of guidelines there now that uh, uh, council cannot overrule because council approved these, uh, this policy. So, you know, he can go out and collect his taxes knowing that he's got the backing of the council behind him and so on. I, I think that's a plus we brought in uh, uh, new garbage regulations, we brought in new dog regulations, and uh, uh, we changed quite a few things in that area. And, uh, and you know, uh, the Newfoundland Labrador Federation municipalities, I'm sure you can remember, you interviewed them. This was the first time that, uh, that uh, they came and held a director's meeting in a, in a, in a Hout port here on the south coast. And, uh, and so therefore, you know, I mean, uh, I, I, you know, this this was done by practically all new councillors, with very little experience in council prior to getting on council. So I really don't think that this council has got any reason to uh, to uh, look back and say that they haven't had successes and that they haven't had firsts. I think we, uh, the town of Burjo, has been uh, brought to the forefront in the media. I'm pretty certain we've had lots of exposure there. Uh, maybe it's not good, but there was an old saying one time that it's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. Now, we've been doing a lot of squeaking. We haven't got a big lot of oil. And, uh, and along with that, you know, there's the improvements to the, even the present water system. I, I, I feel that the water uh, today is uh, even under the old system and so on that we've got... Uh, policy there now whereby as far as the testing, the chlorination, checks is being made and we didn't have to wait for Washington to happen. I can assure you it's over there for anyone to go read that the Virgil Town Council was <coughs> proactive in uh, trying to provide good potable water to the people and of course the new system hopefully will be coming on stream. Uh, nothing to move yet as far as I know. Of course I've been gone for a while. Uh, so therefore, the new system is, uh, it, you know, uh, we got working on that, and uh, and uh, we've got government commitments. So if commitments is worth anything, that's something. With regard to the fish plant, I can assure anyone in this town that every meeting of council, there was no council that could work any harder than this council did towards trying to reactivate that fish plant. It's not easy. It wasn't easy. It's still not easy. If it had been an easy problem. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the plant would be open today, but it's just one of those things that that wasn't easy. And uh, that's what we've done. Another thing I'm pretty sure we've done, we made mistakes. And hopefully we've learned from them. Uh, that was quite a list. Well. Yeah, that was quite a list. And matter of fact, at least some of them we probably even forgot. <laughs> um, what made you decide to, uh, to throw your ethnic ring again for this election? Well, there's some things which, you know, is not finished. Uh, there's the fish plant up there. Uh, it's not open as far as I'm concerned. And maybe another four years it still won't be open. But, uh, you know, uh, that's one of the things, you know, having, having put your hand to the plow, you should keep it there until the job is finished. So I'm certainly going to keep continuing at that. That's one of the things. I guess the other thing is that I've got a, a deep, a deep root for Burjo. It's a town, you know, where I was born and grew up. And uh, I'm open that it's not going to die. And so therefore, I believe in the last time you interviewed me, I said that, you know, even if it does die, um, having been involved and in trying to save it, at least, you know, you gave it your best kick and you tried. Okay. And uh, I guess that's two of the main th of the uh, reasons I ran again, and 
And maybe the other one was that uh, I wanted to probably see an election and uh, see how I fares out there. Uh, to tell you the straight truth, you know, I'm, uh, I'm retired, but I'm not uh, put out to pasture yet. And, uh, and, and I, I've enjoyed, the, there's been, I've been disappointed, but I've certainly enjoyed the work that I've had with council, and, uh, and I feel there's, there, there's still a job to be done. And uh, therefore, uh, I decided, yeah, I'd give it a second term, you know. Okay, now, uh, if you're elected on uh, September 25th, what are some things that you would like to accomplish? Well, I guess the most important thing that I would like to accomplish is uh, I'd like to see the fish plant open. You know, but uh, sometimes that is such that uh, sometimes it's out of your control. There's, uh, there's not a big lack you can do about that. But even at that, you know, I'd like to see uh, I, I'd like to see the new water system installed and and properly set up. And like I said, I'd like to see the plant open. I'd like to try uh, and keep the taxes down so that the people of Berger will be able to uh, afford to live here and enjoy uh, the luxuries which other towns uh, enjoy with a minimum of taxes. I would like to have a tax structure such that it would be, it would encourage uh, entrepreneurs to come into Berger and, uh, and for some reason I would like to see Berger start thinking of itself as the UB down in this area and start looking at itself as being the service center. And I, I sometimes think that maybe that might be where our future lies, you know, in, the, in uh, what services we can provide to the outlying areas. And uh, I think along the tourism line, I think there's a, there's a, I don't think we've touched that at all, Aaron Berger, to be quite honest with you. Uh, we're moving in a certain direction, but I still think that the the benefits that will uh, that can flow from tourism all it takes is people to get involved. I'd like to encourage uh, good, credible uh, uh, entrepreneurs to move into Burjo. I'd like to see people who's coming into Burjo to not only make bucks for themselves. That is everybody should be trying to do that who's trying to get in business. But I'd like to see credible business people who are coming in there for not only to do themselves, but also to do the town good. And uh, I've got no use for people who's going to be just using Virgil as a way, as, as a stepping stone to line their own pockets and move on. Uh, these are some of the things that I'd like to see, and I mean, over the year, uh, the years, the next four years, if we're on council, uh, I'd like to see us probably in our first year, if we're elected, to sit down and try to set some goals and objectives that we'd like to, to work towards in our four-year term. Okay. Uh, of course, none, nobody is more aware of the unemployment situation in Berger than you are yourself. That's for sure. Uh, where do you see Berger five years from now? Oh, boy. That's a big question. <laughs> I'd like to see Berger, and for some reason I like to think, anyway, that... Well, I guess the best way to answer is this. If nothing happens within a very short time, I think Virgil will be a town of uh, senior citizens. Uh, however, I haven't said that. If we keep the pressure on and the will to change and do something in the town is taken seriously, I would like to say that in five years from now, Berger will be booming better than she ever was. That's what, that's the optimistic view. Uh, that's going to take everybody on side and everybody working for the same goals. That's the entrepreneurs, the union, the town council, and, and especially the people working towards that goal. We've got to get on with something and move something on. You know, I mean, uh, one of the big things that I, I'll be quite honest with you has bugged me ever since I've been on council is the fact of the fish being trucked out of Virgil. I don't think that's good enough. And uh, personally, 
I would really like to see with the fish, even though it may be only 15 or 20 jobs, I'd like to see the fish that's in Burjo, and not only in Burjo, I think the fish in the surrounding areas, the little bit, whatever there is, the bit of cod or whatever. I'd like to see the fish from Franceway, Gray River, uh, Grand Brit, Burjo, Ramya maybe, I don't know. But I'd like to see some effort being made somewhere to get that fish done right here in Burjo. That's the way I look at it. Okay. Uh, this, I don't know if this is a, a appropriate question or not, but I pose it to everyone else. Um, after the election, if the voting is in your favor, will you accept the mayor's position again? Well, now I've given some thought to that, Marie. I've got no problem with being mayor, put it that way. However, if you know there is a, a, a quite a gap between the person who polls the most votes and the number of votes that I poll, that will play a big part into whether I will accept the job as mayor. Because, you know, if someone polls a sizable number of votes more than I do, I think that would be a message, or I should take it as a message from the people of Virgil, that they haven't been really satisfied with my leadership. So therefore, you know, I would really have to give that a lot of thought. And if uh, that do happen, then I would certainly not uh, take the job there. And I've got no problem serving on council as a councillor also. But, you know, I mean, uh, it's, I mean, we've got to be realistic. And, and uh, you know, if, uh, if, if there is uh, someone there that the people of Burjo prefers, which they will signify by their votes, then uh, that's the person who should uh, lead the town as far as I'm concerned. Um, now, as a mayor, and, and you've served a term four years, uh, do you feel that you have um, a certain amount of support in the town? I think I've got a fair amount of support in the town. Of course, you know, we've got some people who've never been on council, so they haven't got any record to uh, defend. Uh, let's face it, I mean, I, I know for sure, I mean, having spent four years on council, that there's some tolls I've, uh, I've tramped on. And when you tramp on tolls, of course, you don't get votes. But, uh, but that's me. I mean, uh, I wouldn't change the way I do things. Uh, I've got my my mind. Uh, I think for myself, and uh, and when I don't agree with something, I just don't agree with it. I don't mean that it's right that I disagree, you know, or nothing like that. But uh, I've got uh, certain standards which I live by and I go by, and so therefore, when you do those kind of things, you you ruffle feathers and one thing and the other, and. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you know, you lose a bit of popularity. So, so therefore, you know, uh, having done four years on council, I'm pretty sure that uh, every councillor there uh, is uh, more or less defending what he's done, whereas a new councillor is uh, has got nothing to defend, but will have that to face in the in the next election, so to speak. So, you know, uh, I, I think I've got talk support out there, but maybe I haven't. Tuesday will tell. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, no, not a big lot, Marie, other than I would say that uh, I would have liked to have seen more candidates. I definitely would. And, uh, and, and I certainly would have liked to have seen some women come forward. And, you know, I mean, we've got uh, hate uh, candidates, and they're all men. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I'm sure, and I know for a fact, that, that there is women in this town, you know, who could have come forward and, uh, and women add something to council. There's, there, you know, there's that Uverdio saying, uh, you, you know, if you want the job done, the, per, the, the best man for the job is a woman. And there is some certain things in council, and uh, we had a kind of woman on our last council. And uh, when you when they do something, they they usually complete it and they tie up the ends and so on and so forth, you know. And uh, so therefore, you know, I, I was a bit disappointed that there weren't more candidates and especially that there was no none of the women of Virgil employed that ran. Uh, I think I forgot to mention there's the thing of the recreation, you know, and I know that there's a case in point there that I'm pretty sure that I've took quite a bit of flack there. Uh, there's something there that 
uh, you know, there's a, a, a certain amount of money in a recreational fund. Uh, if I'm elected back on council, uh, I certainly don't uh, feel that we're going to let that money sit there for another four years. I mean, people of Virgil gave a hundred and something thousand dollars, or I just don't know the exact figure. It's just sitting there in the bank. Now, I, as far as I'm concerned, that's got to go into some form of recreation in Virgil, which will be determined, no doubt, about, by the council and the people of Virgil. But uh, at the end of the, the end of the period, I'm pretty sure that Virgil ended up with some form of recreation, be it a, a skating rink, a swimming hole, or baseball field, improved softball field. I don't know. But uh, that, I mean, that will be, in my opinion, one of the first things that the new council will have to tackle. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing I guess I would like to say is uh, I would like to thank uh, the uh, previous council, the present council. Uh, there's some good councillors there. They're all good councillors as far as I'm concerned. I can assure you that uh, our council meetings were... Uh, were quite open. I think everybody felt they had a, a, a free chance to express their opinions. Opinions were given. There was nothing to stifle. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things which I uh, thought very seriously during the four years of uh, getting BBS to come in and film council meetings. It, it doesn't mean a thing to me. It wouldn't bother me. However, if, uh, if you know, you get the feeling that the camera will stifle debate, then is it a good thing? You know, you're, I mean, uh, some people would not feel like speaking out the same in front of a camera as they would. So, uh, so you know, if you're going to bring something in that would uh, probably limit debate or certain people wouldn't express their opinion, then if that would be the case, you know. So that's the reason uh, I just thought about it in passing and then cast it one side because, you know, there's no way that I would like to stop anyone from forming, uh, expressing their opinions on certain matters. And, and like I say, I, I'm really thankful for the uh, present council. I tell you, Virgil, in my opinion, we've changed councils during the year. We had uh, only f five councillors for the last year or so close to it. And uh, therefore, it required, you know, everybody turning up at the meetings and so on. And, and I thought they were good. And uh, so therefore, I wish them all the best. And I wish all the candidates the best. Uh, like I said, I wish there was more because another thing is uh, after Tuesday there's going to be one person who's going to be out. And I don't think there's anything worse than being out alone. You know, if you even met a, a buddy that goes out with you, you know, but being just by yourself and the only one out, uh, well, I'm sure everybody understands what I'm talking about there. So I'd like to thank them and, uh, and I really would like to tell the people the main thing is get out and vote. Who you want on council, get out there and vote for them. You can vote for one, two, or seven. But for God's sake, don't vote for eight. If you vote for eight, you've got a small ballot. <laughs> so, you know, I, I would really encourage people to get out and, uh, and uh, the people, the candidates who put their names forward are now depending on you to support them. And you will show your support by going out and voting. And uh, if there's anyone needs transportation, uh, well, I just tell you, you can phone me, 886-2592. Even if you're not going to vote for me, uh, you can phone me. I'll give you trans, trans, transportation. I wouldn't think much of it, but <laughs> at the same time, you can. <laughs> anyway, we thank you very much for joining us, and okay. we wish you every success in Tuesday's election. Thank you, Marie. And we, we would like to remind our viewers to get out and vote on Tuesday, September the 25th. Residents may vote for any number of candidates up to but not exceeding seven. We would also like to remind those who can't get out to vote that you can appoint another person to vote for you by proxy. Just call the town office for more information. But remember, get out and vote. The next time you visit the community center, you may notice some brightly colored posters posted up. These posters have been posted up around the community center due to the increase in the number of individuals bringing their own refreshments to the community center during private and public functions, for example, during weddings and Lions public dances. Lions members have noticed that individuals involved in this practice have become bolder and have very little respect for the law regarding a fully licensed liquor establishment. 
this sort of behavior will not be tolerated. As the poster reads, the Burgia Lions Club has no tolerance for anyone caught bringing their own liquor into the center, and these people will be dealt with accordingly. Stay with us for Off the Rack, the community events, and the BBS Playbill, all after this. The lawnmower cut off my foot. I sit down to wet feet and got my hand caught in the mixing chain. And I went right under the boat, and the motor, it cut, it cut my leg. In a new video by the War Amps called Spot the Danger, kids in the CHAMP program warned that safety is no accident. For more information about the Play Safe program or Spot the Danger, please contact the War Amps. Play Safe. Off the rack. This week as we scanned our tape rack, we came across a tape of another whale. This one was located in the reach area. Let's look back to September the 7th, 1997. Something unusual floating in the reach caught the attention of residents of Hares Hill as well as onlookers around mid-August. It was first believed that the visitor was a dead shark, but it was later deduced that it was a whale, not a shark, floating in the reach. BBS Playbill. Tune in on Tuesday for a rebroadcast of Pansy's Garden. Join Pansy and the gang for two stories, a craft, and lots of fun on Saturday morning at 11 a.m. on Pansy's Garden. Next Sunday at 6.30 p.m. we will have religious revelations from the United Church. And I'll be here again next week with This Week in Review. For This Week in Review, I'm Marie Rose. Good night and God bless.